Well, good morning, everybody. So I was asked to speak on the next topic in a series um, that Travis has been talking about character, and it's going to be about character. So Travis is like, can you do a sermon on character? And I'm like, sure. And then I'm thinking about it. I'm like, that's a big subject. That's a, there, you know, I mean, like the whole Bible revolves around godly character. And I'm like, how do I get this into one sermon? So I rested on a few things. So first of all, we'll start with the definition definition of character and what that actually is in the Bible. If you look up character in, like, say, the King James, which I'm addicted to and I've been using since I was a child, uh, you won't find that word. In fact, you won't find it at all. You'll inf instead, you'll find the word image. And we're going to bring up a verse uh, in Hebrews chapter 1, verse 3. Before I do that, though, who here has ever been to a job interview? Really? Just some of you? Who here has a job? Okay. Just trying to process that. All right. When you go to a job interview, or if you're like me and you're doing the job interview, um, one of the things you're looking for is character. Okay. And so sometimes your employer or potential employer will ask you for a... Oh, good. See, you guys have been to them. Okay. A character reference. Those are important because I want to know who I'm hiring. But even then, they can be biased. And what I've found is that after you hire somebody, it takes a period of about five to six months before they actually reveal who they are. And the reason that takes that long is because you need to see them encounter different situations that tests that character. And then it's revealed. And then you can decide how you're going to use this person in your organization. You can say, okay, well, this person, I, I can, I've seen them react to this and that. They're going to be good in this role, and I know that I'm going to have success with them if I put them there. So. In the same way, when it comes to Christian character, okay, God has a certain standard for us, and we should have the same standard for ourselves. Amen. Okay. And that character will define your relationship, not with just God, but your brothers and sisters in the Lord, and additionally, how you fit into ministry. So this topic is very important. Um, so let's bring up... Did you lose my scripture? Okay, there it is. Hebrews chapter 1, verse 3. So, who being the brightness of his glory, and this is speaking of Christ, I'll give it away. Who being the brightness of his glory and the express image of his person, and upholding all things by the word of his power, when he had himself purged our sins, sat down at the right hand of the majesty on high. So, uh, brightness of his glory and the express image, there it is. Okay, so this word image here is an, our English word to describe the Greek word character, which is where we actually get our word character. I know, weird, right? Why don't they just use the word when they translated it, character, because that we already picked that word up. But they didn't. They used image. But the reason they didn't was because in the original Greek, the word character didn't mean like we mean it entirely. The Greek word character actually meant like a stamped copy. So when Jesus said, whose image is on the coin, okay, he was actually literally asking like, like it was like an exact copy of the person it was made after. So when the Bible says that Jesus is the express image of God, it means that he is completely, perfectly a copy and representation of God. Okay? So we're good there? So that's when, when you, whenever you see the word image in the Bible, you, it's actually hinting towards character. And so... We use the word character to describe certain traits, uh, qualities that make up a person. Agreed? Okay. He has a good character, a bad character. Okay. And we're always being told we should shape our character, change our character. We want to, we're always, everybody here has at some point or is actively right now trying to change who they are. Okay. We're always trying to shift how we act or how we see things. And so a lot of us, okay, will choose something to copy our image or our character after. This is natural because we need an example. As artists, most artists like to try, will try to, you know, if they're making a painting of somebody, we'll need to look at that person to make a painting of them. And in the same way, we will choose for ourselves um, idols, forgive the word, or examples, movie stars, people that we admire and say, I want to be like that person. And we'll endeavor to copy their traits. Now, hopefully this person is a godly person. Okay? There's a lot of ungodly people out there. And, 
And you know, even good people, Christians, are trying to copy not necessarily godly men and women. Hopefully, we're looking at Christ and we're trying to copy his character into our own lives. Um, there is a danger, though, in trying to copy ourselves after men and women or even after Christ. What are you talking about? Okay. When we try ourselves to copy something, what ends up happening is we're working in the flesh. Okay, we are trying, we are trying to do it. What you will find happening is that even, after you, even if you're trying to copy the characteristics of Christ, when you're doing it by your own hand, you will have help that you didn't realize was there until maybe it's too late. The enemy is always right there, interjecting his little bits of information into your character molding, if you're doing it in your own strength. So, the big question we as Christians need to ask ourselves before we get any further in this is, whose character do I have right now? Whose character do you have? Sorry, I'm pointing again. People don't like that when I point. Where you put your gaze on will determine your character shaping. Now, Travis did a sermon a while back about road guards, okay? And there was examples of when you drive and you're looking straight ahead, you, you're technically supposed to look as far ahead as you possibly can into down the road because that will result in the straightest course, right? If the closer you look, the more unadjusted you will become. And if you look off to the left or the right or down at your phone, then you get just potential that is just crazy where you can go with that. So we always have to be looking at Christ, the author and finisher of our faith, first of all. So we do need to look at him as an example. So let's go to Romans 1, 22, 23. This scripture verse is in line with what I was talking about, the danger of um, trying to shape your character with your own hands. Um, while I was writing this message, um, I felt like the Holy Spirit was telling me that when we, when we try to shape ourselves after the image of Christ in our own strength, what we actually do is we take the form of Christ and we change it and we actually end up making an idol or, an, or a, a copy of God in our own image. So, yeah, so professing to be wise, they became fools. Next verse. And changed the glory of the incorruptible God into an image made like corruptible man. That was the key point right there. The importance of not changing ourselves with our own strength to be like Christ is because of this. One of the reasons, anyways is we actually end up in changing an uh, the image of an incorruptible God into the image of an incorruptible man. And then we wonder where we went wrong. See, Christ is a rock formed without hands. And how can we reasonably expect to have success copying Christ by the work of our own hands? Now, the Holy Spirit was the only one mandated on this earth to shape character. Submitting and seeking him is key to achieving Christ's character. And the effort, then, that we make is to walk in the spirit and not after the things of the flesh. So this is where you have all the scripture talking about walk not according to the flesh, walk according to the spirit, and the importance of that. It's because if you're not listening and hearing the Holy Spirit as you're building character and submitting to him, then you're not building Christ-like character. You're building your own. You're building yourself into your own image. And in the end, what you discover is, is you're not actually changing your character. The Holy Spirit is. You're just doing what you're told. So the Holy Spirit says, look it, I noticed this. You need to walk this way or do this in this situation. And we have a choice at that point. Am I going to do it or am I not going to do it? Now, one of the things I noticed, just as a tip too, is... When you feel like you've been shaping your character and you've been doing really well and you're having success in a certain area of your life, and you're like, wow, I've been having victory after victory after victory over this thing, and you're like feeling pretty good about yourself, the moment you have the thought, you've been doing pretty good, okay? Hold on, 
don't say, oh, you don't even know where I'm going with that, or do you? <laughs> the moment you, ha- moment you think to yourself, I'm doing pretty good in this, you are about to be attacked, attacked by the enemy. The enemy is literally about to launch an attack. Beca- that's the preliminary question, because what it does is that the moment you say, I have been doing pretty good about that, you've just stepped out of the spirit into the flesh, taking credit for what Christ has done in your life and what the Holy Spirit has been doing, and you're wide open, and the enemy just, boom, will attack you. And about 24 hours later, you're slipped back into something you've been trying to stay out of. So Matthew 7, verse 1. Let's get to the core of it. Judge not that you be not judged. Jesus gave us explicit Instruction, to not judge other people. Now, you may or may not know this, but Scripture uses the word judge in two different ways, very different ways. In this way, the word judge means quite literally to not inflict penalty or consequence to somebody for something you identify. Okay, Because in other parts, we are told to judge. Jesus says, you'll know them by their fruits. Okay, the other type of judge means to discern or to ascertain the nature of something. Okay, or the measure, yes. So, right away, I just want to kind of get that out in the open so everybody understands that it's okay to judge yourself. All right, it is okay for you to look at your own life. Okay, I've heard it. I've heard people say to me, like, I don't know how many times, only God can judge me. You know, nobody knows my heart. Nobody knows where I've been. I'll just wait for God to judge me. I was like, no, 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 no. The Bible says we are supposed to what? 2 Corinthians 13, 5. Examine yourselves as to whether you are in the faith. That's a pretty big statement. Okay, we're not even talking about just if you're a good person. We're talking about as to whether or not you're in the faith, and that's a whole other lesson to itself. But test yourselves. Do not, do not know yourselves that Jesus Christ is in you. In other words, don't you know Jesus is supposed to be in you? So examine yourself to see if he is. We have to question ourselves. We need to ask ourselves, why do we do this or that? Okay. What was your motivation for doing it? And the answer will reveal your character. So now, I'd like to propose to you that good works are not proof of salvation. Just as much as salvation does not come by them. Okay, can we just get, we'll eliminate that right now. Good works are also not evidence of Christ's character in you. Good works will flow out of faith and Christ-like character, but they are not a measuring tool to determine the character of Christ in you. Because you can fake. Okay, your flesh is deceitfully wicked. Your heart is deceitfully wicked. It will, it can, it's totally capable of faking when I do job interviews with people, they can sit there, smile, and look like they have the best character in the world. And I'm like, wow, what a quality stand-up guy. I am so lucky he is applying to work at my company. And then five years, uh, sorry, pardon me, five months later, I have to let him go. Because his character was revealed. Anyways, good works can also be done to gratify your worldly character, and they can be done in the wrong spirit. Often good works that flow from the character of Christ formed in you are seldom seen by others, as we often do them in secret and only want to glorify our Savior and not ourselves. So did you catch that? Okay, so in other words, usually, not always, I'm not saying that everybody does good works for everybody to see as a bad person. I'm just saying it's just not proof. And quite often, it's the things that are done in secret that are the proof. And you don't know about those because they're secret. So do not let the, let the left hand know what the right is doing. So if you're an actual, like, if your character is Christ-like, a lot of the times people know, won't even know what you're doing. And they're not worried about that. So for example, giving can be done out of a sense of Christian obligation or because you are personally gratified at being seen as a generous man or woman of God. Okay, well, that's self-evident. I'm, you probably heard that a hundred times. How about praying in front of others can be a means to demonst- demonstrate what is the depth and width and height of your vocabulary and eloquence? Well, I hear chuckles. I think we've all heard that one before. 
Okay, how about this? Prophecy can be done by a demonic spirit. Psychics and leaf readers abound. Um, my family is full of them. I'm a first-generation Christian. No, actually, that's not. No, I'm second because my parents were first. They broke the ground. This was the case when Paul rebuked women from speaking out in the church meetings in Corinth. Historically, the city had a woman's cult led by a false prophetess. This is just general history now. It's not talked about specifically in the Bible, but there was a letter written addressing this issue because it was a real thing historically. Historically, the city had a woman's cult led by a false prophetess. It was a woman's club. The spiritual warfare was real, and women who attended church had not all converted and would randomly manifest. And so they're having a problem with this, and so they're like, Paul, what do we do? And Paul says, it's simple, just don't let the women speak out in church. Just tell them to be silent and listen. He wasn't trying to be feminist, a sexist, pardon me. It was just that there was an issue going on in the city, and he had to address it. Now, don't throw rocks at me. Even speaking in tongues can be counterfeited. Though an evidence of the Holy Spirit, it is not proof of salvation. Eastern religious people have hands laid on them and the force imparted so they can speak in the language of the spiritual guides who have ascended to higher planes. I could show you a video of this, but it's grotesque. But they do it. So, if we can't depend on what we thought we could depend on as proofs for who a person is, how can we ascertain how can we ascertain that person's character, or our own for that matter? Thankfully, God has addressed this. Now, I will say this. 1 Corinthians 3.11, please. It's one of my favorite scriptures, by the way. For no other foundation can anyone lay that which is laid, which is Jesus Christ. Carry on. Even so, every good tree bears good fruit, but a bad tree bears bad fruit. Next verse. A good tree cannot bear bad fruit, nor can a bad tree bear good fruit. Every tree that does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. Therefore, by their fruits you will know them. So I did a, we did like a men's breakfast thing over here, and, and one of the things we talked about was um, the measure of success. And so we were talking about how do men, as men, how do we know we're successful or not at something? And we went to the fruits of the Spirit. Essentially, your ministry, how many speaking arrangements you have, how much people pay you to do the speaking, how many books you have published, how many people know your name. Oh, I know that guy. is not a measure of success in terms of the kingdom of Christ, kingdom of heaven. Measure of success is what's your fruit? How fruitful are you? So, I know we've already read this a hundred times. I'm going to read it again. Galatians 5.20. So we're going to talk about, very quickly, we're going to read and identify what bad fruit looks like. Okay? Galatians 5.20. Bad fruit is the manifestation of the flesh and the world, and it's Satan's character. Okay, just to put this, what we're reading here. This is Satan's character. And if you can't get it up, I'll just read it out loud. Idolatry, witchcraft, hatred, variance, emulations, wrath, strife, seditions, heresies. Verse 21, envies, murders, drunkenness, uh, revel revelings, and such like, of which I tell you before, as I have also told you in time past, that they which do such things are not going to inherit the kingdom of God. Now, good fruit is the manifestation of Christ's character. This is why we want to see if it's in our lives. And that's Galatians 5.22, the very next verse. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith. And the next verse, meekness, temperance, against such there is no law. Now, some people read the fruits of the Spirit, and they kind of breeze through them, and they're just like, oh, those are nice, you know, life from fairyland, and, you know, this is, this is what we should look like, you know, that's great, and I, I think I'm pretty sure I've got at least one or two of those nailed down, and we just kind of skip by it, and we go right back to the spiritual gifts and signs and wonders, and we're like, those are the ones I want. That's what I want, God. God! In my prayer closet, mind you, nobody can see me. God! I want to manifest your presence. 
I want to lay hands on the sick and see them healed. Then they'll know you are God. God's like, yeah, but unless you've got fruit, that's not going to happen because I care more about your well-being and your spiritual profitability than I do what you want. So we are commanded to be fruitful and to bear good fruit. A fruitful tree, I'm just going to read off my notes here because that's why I wrote them. A fruitful tree is desirable. It's profitable and refreshing to those who eat from it. Everyone wants a good fruit tree like that in your yard. I mean, most people. I mean, unless you're not a tree person, you just like the grass the, and no weeds. But if you, like, if you like plants in general, then most people would like the thought of a good, profitable, yielding fruit tree in their yard. Okay? Now, if though you have a tree and the fruit is poor quality and nobody wants to eat it, and believe me, they exist because, you know, you walk up to a tree, you ever done that, and go, you pick one of the fruit, like, oh, nobody's just all this fruit's here, nobody's touching it. It's like, oh, man, I scored. And then you take one of these fruit and you bite into it, and you're like, oh, that's not good. And I understand now. So if you have a tree and the fruit is poor quality, nobody wants to eat it. Instead, it falls to the ground, rots, drawing wasps and flies. Okay, who have seen the fruit trees, all the fruits on the ground, it's squashed, people have been stepping on it, broken open, there's all these wasps all over it, and you're like, oh, kids, don't play near the fruit, because you're going to get stung. You know, like, oh, why doesn't somebody clean that up? Right? Nobody wants to eat it, and you can't even sit in its shade for risk of being stung. Instead, you have to constantly clean up after it, and even at times, keep people, keep people away from it to avoid a hurtful situation. So we don't want to be that kind of tree. I mean, at least you'd think you'd be good for shade. But if you're not good for shade because your fruit is bad, it's like people are just, after a while, when your character's revealed, people are just going to naturally want to say, okay, you know, just, just, no, no, don't go over there. It's not a good idea. All right, you have a great yard. I know. Thank you. Just don't go over there. That tree, I don't know. We're thinking about cutting it down, burning it. You know, just, just don't go over there. So when it comes to ministry, you may have an incredible vision, okay, and a calling on your life. And that is how God sees you and the vision he has for what you will be, okay? I, I don't want to, like, discourage everybody here. I want everybody to be encouraged, okay? That is how God sees you, okay? But we have to allow the Holy Spirit to shape our character, but if your fruit is not good, then it is unwise for you to be in full-blown ministry. Just, I say unwise. Just being truthful here. I went through a long years of bad character where, you know, and I'll just be transparent a little bit. Um, Alice and I have been going to this church, like, for a long time, anyways. And it felt like to me for a while that I was being overlooked for like ministry. But Allison was always being asked, can you go and speak at this and that? And I'm just like, uh, okay, God, maybe just, you know, maybe you just want me to have a praying ministry. So I'll just, I'll just, I'm good with that, God. And, you know, but in my heart, I wasn't good with it and God was working on me. You know what I mean? But God wasn't going to put me into a position of ministry when my heart wasn't right because it wouldn't be good for everybody else. Or me. Church leadership are not on the top. They are on the bottom. I just wrote, um, drew for a company, I just drew um, a company diagram that shows everybody's positions and arrows and how the departments interrelate. Because I was realizing the people in our company didn't have a full vision or understanding of how everybody interworked together. Everybody was like, well, I don't understand. What... You, you know your job. No, kind of. You know. And so I wrote this thing out. And I, ha I wrote it, and I put myself on the top, and then I put all the managers, and I worked its way down. And then I was showing it to everybody, and I suddenly realized, I was like, no, this is the other way around. So I turned it upside down. I said, that's better. See, church leadership is always on the bottom, holding everyone up. And if the fruit is not in your life, you will stumble and fall holding up others and cause pain. You can't, you can't bear it up under it if you don't have the character for it. Because it's the pressure, it's the stress that will reveal your character. And if your character isn't well established and you're not founded on Christ for that character, you will not be able to bear up. 
And everybody that comes tumbling down will be hurt because of you and because of those who put you there. The weight of ministry will force out your true character. And if your character is not the rock, and I just said that, many a God-ordained ministry has faltered or been utterly corrupted by bad fruit. A little leaven can leaven, uh, leaven the whole lot. And it's better to be on the ground rather than risk using it. So finally, if your fruit is not good, how can you disciple others? How can others find rest beneath your branches? People that you disciple will become like you. You are what you eat. That just popped in my head now. I plan on saying that. If your fruit is good, then God will spread your seed abroad because it will yield a crop. Okay? God, how come I'm not the one speaking all the time? And how come people don't seem to care when I say things that are deep revelations? How come they don't? Like, what's wrong? How come, you know, I, I got stuff to offer here. I've got skills, talents. I imagine about them all the time. I'm just being facetious. I'm sorry. I apologize. I, I, that's my, my, humor, my humor type. I'm not serious. But to a certain extent, you see, God promises something. And we're going to read about that. But if you have good seed, don't worry. You don't have to prove it to anybody. God will sow it everywhere because he wants that seed to grow. That's what he wants. At your work, if you are a bad employee, and I keep coming to this because it's what I understand well, if, if your boss recognizes excellent character, don't worry. He'll put you where he wants you. And sometimes that'll feel like, like a really crappy position. Man, the boss must not like me. He's got me in this really dark room doing this menial task. But what you don't realize is the boss is on the looks at the whole thing and he sees and he's like, man, I need that guy doing this. Because even though it seems like it's nothing, it has huge impact everywhere else. I need him doing this. But we often like complain and be like, oh, God, I don't want to do that. It's not, you know, I'm better suited for that over there. Don't you think, God? You know, like, can we negotiate here? I'm a little bit, I got a little bit of Abraham in me. So let's, let's go. And God is like, no, 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 trust me. I, I, I know what I'm doing. I'm God. I've been doing it for a while. So let's go up Matthew chapter 6, verse 4. Okay. So just, now this is not specific about character, but it kind of is. And it's basically God letting us in on a little secret. So, that your charitable deed may be in secret, and your father who sees you in secret will reward you openly. And then 6-6. Six, six. But you, when you pray, go into your room, and when you have shut your door, pray to your father who is in secret place, and your father who sees in secret will reward you openly. And 618, okay? So that you do not appear to men to be fasting, but you to your father who is in secret place, your father who sees in secret reward you openly. So there's a theme here. The theme is this. Don't promote yourself. Don't feel like you need to be promoted. And if you feel like you're being overlooked, it's not your boss who's doing it or your leadership. It's God. Because God has not deemed it time. He sees what your image can be. I mean, how often have we received word from positive encouragement people saying, you know, like, I see this in you. And we're like, thank you. Why doesn't anybody else? And we get upset. I have. It's like, wow, you're, you're really good. Yeah, can you tell my pastor that? or my youth leader, or whatever the case is, you know. But it's God. It's God who, who, it's God who does it openly, not man. So if you have a problem, or if you're questioning, God, what's wrong with me? Okay? Be ready for the response. And it may not come through the Holy Spirit directly. It might come through people. You know, how dare you criticize me? Don't you know who I am? I'm a king and queen. I am the righteousness of Christ Jesus. Yes, you certainly are. And you need to develop your character. You don't have to push open a door that God has said he will open. 
Can you somehow add to God's complete work? Can you, through the strength of your will and work of your hands, do what God has intended? That character is manifested in secret, God will show the world. 